Good afternoon, everybody. David Bregman, President of the Metro Council. On behalf of my colleagues, including who's here, uh, Councilor Liberty, and I think others may join us, we welcome you. People may know that um, when I was in high school, I was sort of a transit geek, and so people will sometimes say to me, gosh, it must have been really lonely back then. You know, it's been so weird and <laughs> unusual, and all your, you know, your friends were probably all playing baseball and all that kind of thing while you were riding buses. But now the truth can be told. Actually, there was one other. There was one other teenage transit geek at that time. And uh, unlike me, he's actually gone on to do well for himself in the field of transportation. And that is Jared Walker, who I met in probably 1974, 1975, when we were both riding the bus to and from high school. Well, but since that time, Jared's become an international expert in transit development, starting here in our hometown of, of Portland. But going on, he has a, a, a PhD in a field that I'm not allowed to mention to you because it's uh, not actually related to transit, but shows that having good liberal arts education is also important. And went on, to, went on to consult in the development of transit systems in places large and small, ranging from Klamath Falls to Vancouver, British Columbia, San Francisco, all types of contexts. He's been involved in service planning and development of, of new networks. Most recent, last two or three years uh, in Australia, where he's now with McCormick, Rank, and Cagney, and one of their leading projects has been the development of a new system for Canberra, the, the capital of Australia. What I've always appreciated about him, now going back 30 years ago, but particularly in the last you know, 10 or 15, is that he's able to blend a theoretical framework and kind of an understanding of the larger issues about uh, community development, about climate change, about centers, these, these corridors, those sort of theoretical issues, while also understanding the practical application. How does something actually work in Klamath Falls? How do we get the public to actually embrace something in terms of the everyday user. So without further ado, welcome all the way from Sydney, Australia, back here to your hometown, uh, Jared Walker. Uh, David's not allowed to mention my PhD, but I am. Uh, I, uh, I have a PhD in theater rights and humanities. I spent my 20s thinking I was going to be a theater director and a Shakespeare scholar. And I, I, um, I didn't do badly at that, but uh, around the time that I was finishing my PhD, I realized that uh, my uh, interest in theater was not sufficiently accommodating the fact that I was having dreams about maps and about geography and about um, things like that. So I had to, and, and it was also pointed out to me later on that when I was a theater director, I was much more interested in interesting arrangements of bodies in space, in other words, visual and, and uh, spatial thinking, than I was in narrative. I was more interested in the visual look of a production than I was in the story it was telling. And although you know that's a perfectly valid approach to that kind of work, it did make me realize that there was something else I needed to be doing. And, and so somehow or other, I ended up being a public transport planning consultant, and I've been doing that for about 20 years. An interesting thing, by the way, about li living and working in Australia, um, although everyone I work with in Australia knows I'm American, and I actually, if anything, turn up the American accent because they seem to, to, to respect it. It signifies that you're international. But um, on the other hand, my language has gradually become uh, in confused with all of these Australian, ultimately British terms, for a lot of the basic uh, concepts in public transit, we would say, or public transport, they would say, uh, as you know, surrounding, for example, streetcars, as we would say, or trams, as they would say, um, uh, transit lines uh, as opposed to transit routes, and so on and so on and so on. So you'll probably hear some weird words, because I, I'm not in complete control of that. Uh, and if you read the blog, you know that, because you, know, you see me going back and forth. Why did I call this a field guide to transit corals? Uh, I'm also an amateur botanist, so I use field guides a lot. And field guides are, are, as a metaphor, more interesting to me because, particularly because of what they do and what they don't do. Um, field guides are useful when you're confronted with the apparent chaos of nature and are trying to understand it or organize your, your, um, uh, organize your understanding um, of, of nature. 
And I think it's worth always pointing out that when, we, when we're trying to organize our knowledge, we're also organizing our ignorance. And I'm, I'm aware of that as I, as I work on, on whatever I'm studying. And a lot of what I'm doing is just building categories so that I can understand this better and accept my complete ignorance of this over here. Um, we're offering, so you know, we're offering tips for, for identifying each category of thing, explains how the categories are related to each other, species in the case of the field guide. And very important, a field guide describes, but it doesn't really judge or recommend. And that's an important connection to what I've been trying to do on human transit for the last few of the year. Although I certainly do have opinions and I, I, I try to be clear about them and I often feel that I'm, it's more useful to go ahead and state your opinion clearly so that everyone can understand what you're saying in those terms. Mostly I'm interested in trying to create you know, uh, thinking tools, conceptual tools, that enable people to make clearer decisions about public health and that make, make uh, broad groups of people able to talk, to, to talk about it. A, um, it doesn't appear here, but one of the most important uh, little quotes that I have out of all of my philosophy training is from a British philosopher by the name of Pierre Strawson, who said at one point, um, around the time that philosophy was really turning into linguistics, that, that what we can't say, if we can't, what we can't say, we can't think. Um, if we don't have a word for a concept, like speed or reliability, or, for example, if we don't have a good word for high-speed service stopping infrequently in an exclusive right-of-way, which could be either bus or rail, we, if we don't have those words, it becomes hard to think about those concepts. And instead, so, and one of the interesting things I, I think is going on in transit debates a lot is that we're, we're hearing the terms bus and rail used to represent a lot of things that aren't actually about the bus rail distinction at all, but are really more about historical accidents about where they've been used here as opposed to there, and what the speaker's particular experience is about. And I'll come back to that a little bit more later. So, um, similar to the chaos of nature, or the apparent chaos of nature when you first see it, there's a chaos in terms of life. There's a, um, there's a, we're constantly being bombarded with uh, statements by people who are expert in all kinds of things, or people who are just expert at reaching the media, um, that, uh, that we're having to try to organize. I think one of the reasons why being a transit nerd these days is fairly courageous, and one of the reasons why a lot of other people don't try to follow transit issues as closely as they can, is that they just get intimidated by the chaos of everything that's being said. And in particular, one of the trickiest things that happens in this chaos is that you get a, somebody makes a statement that contains a bit of expertise. Uh, rail stimulates development, for example. Well, if, if somebody's a developer, uh, you're going to assume that they know what they're talking about, and you're going to accept that. Um, and um, what, but what you're actually getting there is a piece of expertise mixed up with uh, some values, some value statements of that person, which may or may not be your values. So one of the things I try to do always in my work is separate out values from expertise. And I use the example often of a plumber. Say you hire a man to fix your plumbing. And he goes to work. And um, you've decided on the goal of the work, fix my plumbing. But you're trusting his expertise just on the half. And it would be nice if we could think about transit that way. It would be nice if we could say, OK, what we want in the barber corridor is something that gets from Portland to Tigard in about 20 minutes and that does and that stops in these and that stops every mile or so or something like that. And then let the experts go figure out whether a busway or a rail line is actually the best way of doing that. Right? Uh, uh, separate out the half. In reality, of course, the conversation is more complicated and they're more circular. And so here the example, here my, my example continues, and I say, okay, imagine you've set a man, set a man to work fixing your plumbing. And right then, so far, you have a really clear distinction between the goal and the expertise. You know, you've set the goal, you've hired the expertise. But he hits a point in his work where he can do it one way or another. And he, he may have to come back to you and say, well, now look at this. I could just, uh, I could just glue this together like that, and it would work for another year or so. Uh, or I can replace the whole assembly, and it'll wait, and it'll work for, uh, for many years, but it'll cost you this amount of money, and we'll have to wait for some parts to come from overseas and whatever. So he's going to come back to you with a choice. That's, I'm very interested in how we go about um, setting up in situations where experts can actually ask those choices back to the person who's defining the goal. And I'll give you a very, a very obvious example that's common in transit. If you look at the emission statements of most transit, 
you'll generally find something there that sounds like maximized ridership, and you'll find something else there that sounds like serve the entire community. Well, as it happens, I'll come back to this later, those two goals are actually contradicting one another. Because if you were actually trying to design a network for the maximum possible ridership, in terms of your own geometry, for example, there would be pretty much no local bus service outside the city of Portland. And pretty much no local bus service east of I-205, and maybe even some of the outer ends of the white line might not make sense. So clearly, that's not what Ryman's actually doing. <laughs> and so, it would be helpful if we could be clearer you know, in the statements that TriMet makes and in the statements that Metro makes in longer term time about what part of our system actually is trying to maximize ridership. What part of our system is doing other things? Some parts of our system may be being there to galvanize future development that will create high ridership in the future. But a lot of your services out there is not really for that reason. It's there to represent some concept of equity or some concept of social service kind of obligation. And when anti-transit experts like Randall O'Toole or Wendell Cox start going off about their inefficient transit, they are inevitably getting to those numbers by comparing the total amount of service that an agency like TriMet operates and the total ridership <coughs> as though TriMet were trying to maximize its ridership, which it is clearly not doing. It is clearly doing a more complicated balancing of several different goals. That's an example of a situation where the expert really ought to go back to the, to the politician, to the leader, to the decision maker, the goal setter, and say, you know, actually this goal and this goal, you're not going to do them both. You need, you need to tell me like how much you want to spend on this goal and how much you want to spend on that. So if it's, a, if it's for example, a trade-off between maximizing ridership and getting a little bit of service to everyone for social service reason, well, um, I've done it a number of times, I've worked with transit agencies, and a couple of them actually do this in their RTPs, have locked into their RTPs, regional transportation plans, policies about what percentage of the budget is to be devoted unopposedly to pursuing ridership, and what percentage of the budget is to be devoted to minimal services that fill in the gaps in that network to serve everyone else. And if an agency, and if an agency can tell me we want 80% of our resources to go to chasing ridership and 20% to providing little social services that we know we know will have few riders. Um, I can design a network that, that, that says, okay, here's, your, here's the network, here's the 80% of services that we think will have high ridership, here's the 20% that we think won't, here's what it looks like. And you can go back and forth and you can actually have a conversation in which the, the board member, the transit agency board member, ends up feeling remarkably empowered because we've separated, what I've done there is separate precisely the values question, the goal question, which only elected officials should all know to make, and uh, that expertise question, which is, yes, if you tell me if you want 80% of your network devoted to ridership, or 70% or whatever you decide, then I can design a network uh, using my own expertise as a network provider that will do that. So that's just all by, point of, by way of introduction and self-distraction, but in terms of so what do we do with the chaos of transit claims? And what do, how do, can ordinary people sort of sort through all the stuff they hear? 